So this, this is what we have to do in terms of the actual funeral services and rites in the Catholic Church. So I'm just going to kind of walk you through there a little bit and, uh, and tell you what's, what's what. Uh, what happened was maybe about 12 years ago, the diocese came out with a template about how to prearrange the Catholic services kind of a thing and was given to all the parishes at the time and everyone was meant to um, make it specific to their parish. There, there's always something that's a little bit different at a parish logistically or whatever. And so, you know, up at Holy Angels, I made it, I Holy Angelized it, and St. Anne's, I St. Anne's Bartleized it, or whatever you want to call it. And in the Holy Rosary, we Holy Rosaryized it, and everything else for that. Uh, but they're pretty much the same basic thing. There's a few things that will change over time. Now, if, if you take a look at it, you get the, you know, the table of contents and stuff. Go to, go to page two, and let me tell you about the funeral rite in the Catholic Church. Now, why, why would you want to pre-arrange this? Partially for the same reason why you'd want to pre-arrange with the funeral home. Because what happens is when somebody passes away and somebody's their executor or the next to kin, and they're suddenly called in and they have to sit down with the deacon or the layperson or the priest and start to decide what they want in their service, a typical answer is, I don't know what my mom really wants or my dad really wants or my Aunt Betty wants or whatever else like that. And, and they're all stressed out because of the death. Because I always point out, no matter how expected a death is, like my dad was dying a multiple myeloma over about a two and three quarter year period, we knew he was dying, but when I finally get that call, it was like a kick in the gut, you know, and you're not yourself and you're, you don't have control of, of your mind and everything else about what to do and what, what and everything. So it really pays to go ahead and to prearrange this. And in the Catholic Church, the funeral services, just like uh, Caesar said, all Gaul was divided into three parts. The, the, funeral, the funeral rites are divided into three parts. Uh, a lot of times the first part is usually referred to as something that's done during the visitation or the wake, or we call it now since Vatican II, a vigil service. And that usually takes place at the funeral home. Okay. Now, historically up to Vatican II, this meant a rosary was recited, and the priest or the deacon would come and recite a rosary with the family and, and all of the other people that knew the deceased Okay, but we live in an area where we're a minority, okay, a real minority. And so a lot of our Protestant friends may really have loved the deceased person, but they're not into rosaries, okay. So there is something, though, that they love, and that's the actual vigil service itself, which is a liturgy of the word. And every time I can talk somebody into allowing me to do the actual vigil service, which are readings from Paul's letters and the gospel and prayers and all these other kinds of things, the people that come up to me and say, man, we really love that, are not the Catholics. <laughs> They're the Protestants. They love that. It reminds them of their Protestant service kind of a thing, except it's not meant to be a eulogy. That's the difference. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, but you can have a rosary if you insist, or you can have the actual vigil service, and it's set pretty much, or you can have both. In other words, if the family wants to have a private rosary with immediate family and friends who are Catholics and want to do the rosary for themselves, uh, first of all, they don't need a clergyman to say a rosary. I mean, even Pat Van Epps knows how to say a rosary. Okay, okay. Mary Pat Van Epps, knows how to do this rosary. And so, uh, you know, it's, she can do it. You don't need that. But the vigil service is beautiful. And, and we're praying for the deceased and everything else like that. And we're praying for ourselves, all of us who remain behind. 
to be able to handle the grief and the sorrow that's going on. So the first thing is that, and normally it's at, as we point out, point out in here, at the funeral home. But what's been happening in the last about five to seven years is that more and more people want us to hold this at the church rather than the funeral home. Uh, why, I'm not quite sure. Uh, in the past, it was at the church if you had somebody who was a major member of the church, you know, and dies and all that kinds of stuff. And we're going to expecting like a like three million people are going to show up for this and it's going to be bigger than even Memorial Park can handle, you know, and so we'll put it in the church. And now we get like people we don't even know who they are that want us to do, do the wake and the visitation in the church. We try to be as cooperative as possible. But usually that vigil service and or the rosary is at the funeral home, usually the night before the second part of the funeral rite, which is the actual funeral itself. And the funeral can be with Mass or outside of Mass. So it can be a funeral Mass, or it can be, again, another liturgy of the Word, that kind of a thing. And usually, if that's that, it's usually done at the funeral home. Now, what I find is really interesting is over the years is that People who are not Catholic and want their loved one buried will often come to me and ask me to do a Catholic service for somebody who's not Catholic. Even Seventh-day Adventists have asked me to do a burial for them, okay, on um, that kind of a thing. Um, but so, uh, in fact, I did one a couple of Sundays ago at Memorial Park because the person's um, own minister backed out. So I get a call Saturday night and said, can you come tomorrow? And I said, you know, Sundays are kind of busy days for Catholic priests, but yeah, what time? And I went and did it, and the person wasn't Catholic, okay? Uh, also, by the way, uh, before the person died, they were in hospice. The daughter was Catholic, so we, they called me, and I went and prayed over the, the father who was dying who wasn't Catholic, too. And so they... they thought of me automatically to do it since their own minister had backed out. But anyway, so you do this funeral, either uh, a liturgy of the word at the funeral home or the funeral mass at the church. And the third part is the actual rite of committal where you go to the graveside or to the crematorium or columbarium or whatever it's going to be. And they're saying, again, prayers and everything else. So why, and from a Catholic perspective, are you doing all these things? As my uh, professor in, uh, in liturgy at seminary used to say, we're trying to bump them up. We're praying for their soul, okay, that they'll be in heaven, and, okay, and we're praying for ourselves who are behind that we be able to deal with all the grief and sorrow and the loss that goes with losing a loved one. And so that's why we're doing all this prayer. So if you work your way through the packet, there becomes then choices that sometimes you have to make. Uh, and they have to do with a lot of things, and we'll show this with some final pa uh, rest of the pages. But on page three, you got this thing of cremation. Okay. For the longest time, the church was very much negative for cremation. Uh, they relented. We now are having more and more people cremated. Ideally, the church would like to see the actual remains at the funeral mass. But most of the time, by the time we're contacted by anybody, the body's already been cremated. And it's like too late. And we've come to the point where we just accept that we're not always going to have the remains. We may have cremains instead. But the church insists that if the cremains are there for the funeral rite, whether it's outside of Mass or in Mass, that those cremains be treated with the same dignity as if they were a body. So you're going to have, you're going to have the, uh, the box and everything else, the urn is in. You're going to have it sitting in front of the altar with the Paschal candle there. It's going to be... Uh, incensed and things like that. There's no pall put on it. It's because it's a box. But anyway, but it's going to be treated with the dignity as if it were really still the body of the deceased person. But we prefer to have the body at the funeral mass. But a lot of times it's just like 
it's too late. So if, if one was to be cremated, mm -hmm. the person wanted a Catholic funeral. Sure, I would do it, yeah. You would have the mass mm -hmm. with the body in a casket, mm -hmm. and then it would be taken back to the funeral home. And he can talk to, to do this, but you you would have to rent a casket for a day. I'm sure they have caskets or rent a day casket, a rent a casket and everything else, and then you cremate. But a lot of times, but what they'll do is as soon as the person and they and they get the bodies released because there's no uh, autopsy or whatever, and the cremation happens, and the next thing you know, it's 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 done. It's a done deal. And, and we get no, and we and we the Catholic Church just accepts that, but it has to be treated with the same dignity. See, we 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 develop that the Jewish idea that a whole person is both body and spirit, body and soul. A Hebrew word was nefesh. There's no real word for soul in in biblical Hebrew, but nefesh meant that person, which was both everything about that that made that person that person. And so we have this whole idea of how dignified a body is meant to be treated, that kind of a thing, okay? Now, as you, you work your way through there, uh, what you should do is take this home, and you start to fill it in as best as you can. You're on page four, you get a bunch of questions, who's your contact, who are you, that kind of a thing, who are your loved ones, okay? Um, the vigil for the deceased, you know, blah, 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 blah. What do you want? Do you want a rosary on page five? Or do you want a liturgy of the word? You know, the funeral mass, okay? I was at a meeting the other day with Monsignor Val Handworker. Some of you know that Val and I are, are pretty good friends. I was his transitional deacon when I was going through seminary whenever I was back in town at the cathedral. And I happen to be 19 days older than he is, and I remind him all the time, and he's calls me on my birthday and sings happy birthday to me every July 3rd, that kind of a thing. And I sent him a card on July 22nd because he doesn't want me to sing happy birthday back to him. But anyway, we were at a meeting and I said to him, I've got to redo all my things now because I'm getting ready to, to, I'll be 71 next July and everything. And uh, uh, are you going to preach at my funeral? Do you plan on hanging around a little bit longer than I'm going to be around? And he said, yeah, for three weeks. Because it's the 19 days, see, the three weeks. So, so Val is going to do my funeral and everything else. At least on, at least on paper, he's going to do my funeral. And so you get a chance to pick uh, where, where do you want the funeral. In this case, mine would be at the cathedral. And who's going to be the celebrant? It's going to be Val Handworker, you know. And it tells you, you know, what do you want for your entrance hymn? What do you want the responsorial psalm? Uh, preparation, all these other kinds of things. What do you want the readings to be? Okay. No, we're going to get to that. We're, we're going to wait through, okay? And everything else, I know. Um, a lot of, lot on the next page, uh, after the post-communion prayer at Mass, some priests like me are fools, and they allow people to come up and do words of remembrance. They're supposed to be like five minutes or less. They wind up being sometimes 20 minutes, and you want to get this hook out and get them to... Because, you see, the Catholic funeral is different than a Protestant funeral. It's not meant to be a eulogy of the dead person. It's supposed to be remembering Christ's victory over sin and death that the person who has died shares in by leading a good Christian life. So it's not meant to be a eulogy like, to, you know, people will usually come up and somebody will speak about, you know, when, I, when we were eight years old, we went and did so and so and so. That's not what's supposed to happen at the funeral. Okay? Yeah, and from the Catholic point of view, you do that at the funeral home when the clergyman's not there, or you do it at the end uh, with the grave interment when the minister's gone and somebody wants to give a eulogy and stuff like that, that's where it is. But it's not at the funeral mass. Unfortunately, when it's a really big dignitary, like you see on TV, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the Kennedys die, you better believe somebody's going to talk for half an hour at the end with a eulogy for him. But that, that's not supposed to be that way. It's not really about the dead person. It's about Christ. It's always about Christ. Everything points to Christ and how that person who has died shares in Christ's victory over sin and death by leading a good Christian life, and you, and you get the readings at the Mass 
to kind of fit into that. So you say a few things about them, but it doesn't become a total eulogy. So, but the, and the words of remembrance turn into a eulogy. And sometimes that can be a little messy. Uh, Mons, there's a Monsignor that used to be uh, full-time here in this diocese uh, who refuses to have words of remembrance at a funeral mass. He comes and says mass here sometime. You know him, don't you? Well, I know who you're talking about. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 And then, this, then you get to page 8. This is where things change. Um, <clears throat> the church is going to have some cost in doing all this stuff. And so each, each parish comes up with their own list of uh, what it's going to cost. You have to pay for the organist and the cantor and all that kind of stuff. And then to go to your question, which starts on page 10, it gives you a listing of readings to choose from. Now, if you're like me, you're amenable, just like uh, Memorial Park is, like you want to change your pre-planning. Somebody will come to me from time to time and say, this person really loved this reading but it's not on your list. And I'll look at the reading, and if it makes sense, I'll say, okay, we'll do it. Some other ones will say, no, it's not, it's not in the manual. This comes out of a right book, okay, for funerals, okay? Well, the Old Testament's always uh, the first reading, okay? Um, huh? Because they feel like these are amenable to what the Catholic Church teaches about what death is all about. Okay, and praying for the dead. You know, there's one from two Maccabees, which, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, during the Easter season, starting page 13, you can have the first reading come from the Acts of the Apostles, if you want, instead of the Old Testament. Just like at regular Sunday Mass, you know, during Easter time, the first re- you know, there's a reading from the Acts of the Apostles all the time during Easter time. Okay, the early church. And then there, then there are also readings that come from Paul's letters that can be uh, a second reading or can take the place of the Old Testament reading as well at any time of the year. Okay? We like Paul. Paul's a good guy. Okay? And it goes on. You notice there's a lot of choices from Paul. And then there's uh, a reading from the first letter of John, to a couple of those, a reading from the book of Revelation you can choose from, and things like that. Okay? And then uh, there's become a um, kind of a um, tradition um, that the priest chooses the gospel. So that's why there's no gospel in these books. Uh, The reason for this very often happens is that somebody didn't prearrange this. And they're working with your secretary and trying to get everything arranged. And the funeral is on Thursday, and it's now Tuesday, and you don't know what the readings are. And it's now Wednesday, and you don't know what the readings are. But you're supposed to preach on Thursday at this funeral. And you have no idea what they've chosen because they're dragging their feet and everything else like that. So if at least the priest gets to pick the gospel out, he's got something for sure that he knows he's going to be able to talk about. Okay? And very often that allows him to uh, do something that's very, very meaningful. Like, for example, uh, I've come to love the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus story. Not just as an Easter story as such, or a communion story, but that these disciples are like the patron saints of everybody who's grieving. Think about that. Their world has come to an end. They've decided that Jesus was the Messiah and he's been crucified and everything else. And, you know, and they're in hiding and they're running around. They're trying to get away from the authorities. And and now they've got these rumors about an empty tomb and all this other kind of stuff. And they're just, they're hurting. And sometimes you know that the family is really, really, really hurting. And I've come to use that story and to use these disciples on the road as an example for the people who are really, really grieving in the pews. You know, and, and, and what, what, what does Jesus say? Well, well, let me open up the scriptures for you. First way to deal with the grief. Then how do they know who he is? The breaking of the bread, the Eucharist. Second 
way to deal with grief. And then the third, what happens? They all go back to Jerusalem. They don't go forward. They go back to where they came from to tell that they've seen the risen Lord. Community. So how do you deal with grief? Scripture, Eucharist, community. And so that, that's why it's good for the, for the priest who has some knowledge of the family to choose the gospel story no matter what. Okay? Now, the one thing that changes at every parish is because everybody's got a different director of music. And so they all have different things that they will allow to be played and things that they will not allow to play. Yes. And that's how it is here. What do you mean? You, you, ask, you know that's the way it is here. No, you don't. Right? Well, wait a while. I'm going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Okay. Um, but anyway, and then finally, we talk about the different funeral homes and the cemeteries to allow people, you know, they'll say, well, I don't really know where even know where to go sometimes. Well, there's, choose one. Here they are. And if you'll allow us to keep some of these booklets and stuff, we'll put those over in the office for you. Okay. Now, anybody got any questions for me? I took more than 15 minutes, but you knew I was going to do that, didn't you? What about the songs? Well, that's, what, that's that last. I know, but what? Depending on which parish you're at. Yeah, they'll, they'll have, they'll, each one will have their own little listing. Sometimes they'll be exactly the same. Sometimes they'll, they'll be a, a song that will be on the list at one parish, not in another. Like, for example, at one time, I was going to be sent to a parish that I had been at for different things, just sitting there, and they would play Danny Boy at the funeral mass. And I said, not if I'm pastor at this church, we're not playing Danny Boy. You know, you want to play Danny Boy someplace else? After I'm gone, go ahead. We're going to play a good hymn, church hymn. We're not going to do that. Okay? Anything else? What do you think, Jay?